Good evening. God's peace to all of you as we come now to the end of another night, of another day, I should say, and to the end of this week now as we draw close, come before our God as we hear his word and receive his gifts, the love that is ours in Jesus Christ. We hear tonight, of course, from the gospel, Jesus will tell us to focus our attentions, right? You can't serve two masters, right? You either will love one or hate the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. So Jesus, of course, he wants us to focus our attention on him, the one who loved us, the one who gives us life for us and grants us his peace this evening. Indeed, may he grant that to us now. Um, so as we gather this evening, a few announcements for us as we kind of gather, as we kind of get the ducks in a row here. You'll see here that in the next couple of weeks, we have VBS will be starting up. Thanks be to God as we uh, kids are registering, as we're preparing for that. Uh, thank you to all of those who participated in setting up for VB VBS. I was told we had over 30 people here last night uh, setting up things. We'll have one more week where we gather and uh, get ready for that, for prep work the next Wednesday night from 6 to 8, so feel free to come on out for that if you'd like to help out. If you want to help out with anything else with VBS too, let Tammy know, or myself, give the office a call. We'd be glad to uh, help you get you to the right place. Um, we'll also, following service this evening, you can go right through the double doors. We're going to have our Sundays on Thursday tonight. We'll have uh, root beer floats tonight, I do believe. And so we'll enjoy a time of fellowship after the service, um, and so come and enjoy some of that as well. Uh, besides that, you'll also see that, uh, give a note here, we met at the church uh, for our congregational meeting this past Sunday. Uh, we have to meet not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, because we have a change in the Constitution and bylaws. And we read it out during the meeting last week, and we have to now wait another week and a half uh, before we can vote on it officially according to our Constitution and bylaws. So that'll be following the service on August 4th there. So you can stay after service, it should be a quick one. The last couple of times we've had to do it, it was just a quick raise the motion, vote, and we're dismissed. Um, so you come out. If you have any questions about it, you can let me know. I'm glad to tell you all the, the change, kind of minor one, uh, but the district wanted us to make sure we had it in the Constitution clearly and put it in there in writing. Um, so besides that, you can follow along with any other the major announcements this month. You'll see our tie this month is going to Lutheran Disaster Response. So 10% 10, 10 of our general uh, offerings will go to that. Uh, as when emergencies respond in the country, they send out teams that help out with those situations. And so now let us, nothing else matters except our Lord and our Lord and Master tonight, Jesus. He's here with his gifts. So now we can just focus our attention on him and give him that praise and that glory for what he has done for us. Let us gather this evening, let us stand as we are able, and present ourselves before our King and our Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. For Almighty God in his infinite mercy has given his only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue by speaking our intro together, responsibly. Behold, God is my helper. He will return the evil to my enemies. O God, save me by your name. And by your life. O 
God, hear my prayer. Give ears to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. For he has delivered me from every trouble. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold, God is my helper. He will return the evil to my enemies. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing our Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation, please be seated as we hear the words of our God tonight. The Old Testament reading for us this evening comes from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 22. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you de deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. You save a humble people, but our eyes are on the haughty to bring them down but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He has made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. O Lord, 
Our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The epistle reading this night comes from Paul's first letter to the Christians in Corinth, chapter 10. St. Paul writes, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as the people of Israel did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, for as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. With our Lord Jesus Christ present among us this evening, please stand as you are able as we hear his word amongst us tonight, as we begin first by singing. to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Also our sermon text tonight. Jesus also said to the, to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him, that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. Now the master commended the dishonest manager, for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another, who will give to you which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the gospel of the Lord. You should please be seated. We sing tonight our sermon hymn, hymn number 730, What is the World to Me?
Dear friends in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, who has been faithful in much in order to give you what is your own by the blessing of God the Father. Amen. Jesus said this in our gospel reading, which we just heard. He says, if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Back in seminary, my wife and I and kids, we lived on campus and married housing. We enjoyed our little two-bedroom apartment there, even though the walls between neighbors were paper thin. They were thin enough that I would often have a conversation between the wall with my best friend at at the seminary on the other side, and more than once, We could even be a couple of rooms over in the apartment, and if one of us sneezed, then we would usually hear on the other side of the wall, bless you. This reminded my wife and I that the space wasn't ours, not even for privacy reasons. There's a joke at the seminary that if you wanted to argue as a couple, you didn't want to do it inside the house, you maybe go outside your car and argue so people wouldn't hear you. You didn't have any privacy. The space wasn't your own. It was given to us, though, for a reason. I was there to study at the seminary. I wasn't there to live indefinitely at my own pleasure. The apartment there did and was built to do what it needed to do. It kept us safe. You know, we were there in St. Louis during times of riots and instability. The apartment also kept us cool when the temperatures down in St. Louis were sort of well into the high 90s, 100s, with 100% humidity often at times, it felt. And of course, 12B Founders Way was also the first place that our boys called home. In these ways, the apartment was a blessing, and we were very thankful for it. But the apartment wasn't ours. There were rules about what we could and could not do with the apartment, just like with any rental. And at the end of the year, inspections were done and fines were issued if any damage were found, even if we put holes on the walls for the pictures. Since the seminary had high turnover of students coming in and out each year, going off the calls, going off the vicarage, coming in, coming back, you didn't want to have dozens of holes in the walls each year to fix. That meant that command strips were our best friends in those days for anything we wanted to put up on our wall. Simply put, the apartment... It wasn't ours. It was loaned to us, given to us to use, but it wasn't my own. In the parable of the dishonest manager and in the commentary that follows it, Jesus this evening reminds us of this very thing that applies to everything that we have and everything that we are. I am not my own. I do not own me as much as I would like to try to make myself think, believe, and do that. Not even my own life belongs to me. It's been given to me by God himself. He's the owner of it. It's his by virtue of creation. He is the creator. I am the creature. And this is also true because of Jesus Christ. And by virtue of God's redemption, I have been bought by the life of and blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is now my Lord. He is also now your Lord. By his death and crucifixion, he has paid for the sins of the whole world, and God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom has been crucified. And this Jesus is also your Lord. St. Paul writes, you have been bought with a price. Jesus is that price. Having a Lord, a master, a landlord in terms of the seminary apartment, it implies a servitude. It has, yes, I can use what's been given to me, but it's been entrusted to me. Having a Lord means that life is lived for and toward that Lord. I live by the sheer grace of God. With the one who carries eternal life and joys, this means that a life of servitude towards your Lord is also a life of freedom. You know, one of the main points that Jesus brings up in our lesson this night is that on this side of things, we are but servants. Servants don't have anything that they can call their own, not even their time, not in their energy, not themselves. What we have is not by ownership. What we have is by a trust from the Lord. We exist 
because God made man. We did not make ourselves. God is the owner. God is the ruler. He is, therefore, the master. The Bible teaches this to us on page one. God made mankind because God desires to bestow blessings on his creatures, that they might share in them. Now, of course, we don't have a choice of having a Lord or not. Even when we rebel against him, we still find ourselves in the position of having a Lord, because being human means that you have a Lord that you answer to, whether you want one or not. You have one. Everyone has a Lord, and everyone ha- is a slave to that Lord. Paul calls himself a slave of Christ in almost every one of his epistles. Everyone has someone or something that drives you, that you serve. What or who you serve is what we would call a God. And your God directs your attention and your focus. It gives you meaning and purpose and drives. It directs how the day and life is going to go, and you follow it. Jesus makes that abundantly clear for us, too. Jesus says no servant can have two masters or lords, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And in his words, you cannot serve God and money. You see, Jesus teaches us with that that everyone has a Lord. You see, the real question in life, after all, is not if you have a Lord or if you have a God. The real question is who is your Lord? Who is your God? Who is the one that you take the shots and you go and you listen and serve? Jesus assumes that you are and will have a Lord one way or the other. You see, everyone has a Lord that they serve. Everyone has a Lord they give their life to, their time, their worries, their efforts, their resources, really everything, because your Lord owns everything. There's no wiggle room here. Jesus expects us either to give our attention, our affection, and our affiliation to God his Father, or we will give that all to someone or something else which is what our translation calls money, but we heard it in our hymn this night before the sermon. It's that word mammon. That's the word that Jesus uses for money. It includes money, but it's also so much more than that. Mammon is getting that new thing that you thought would finally make you happy, and now it just collects dust while you go after that other new something that you thought you you think you really now will make you happy. That's mammon. Mammon is that success you have gotten after you've chased after this or that, thinking, this is going to finally satisfy me. But after you achieve it, well, it's time to look on to the next goal, right? That, That wasn't enough. That was small compared to the next thing. Essentially, mammon is that wanting that dopamine hit to last just for a moment, when we get what we want. Mammon is taking a good gift that God has given, such as our life, our health, government, technology, military power, family, love, careers, sports, etc., etc., all good gifts from God that he gives, and yet never being satisfied with them. And these good gifts of God then become corrupted. Instead, this God called mammon owns us. It becomes our Lord. Mammon is a false Lord because mammon never gives what it promises. It's the carrot held at the end of the six that you just, if you reach just a little bit further, you'll get, but you never get there. But when something is your Lord, whether it is the true Lord or a false Lord, you come to fear your Lord. You love your Lord. You trust in your Lord. That's what the small catechism tells us. You fear, love, and trust in God, your Lord, above all things. With this, we can come to understand that there is nothing secular on this earth. And we always talk about your faith over here, but then the secular life. That's a false dichotomy there. There is no action on this planet that humans do that is not done for a religious reason. The idea of living on this earth being disconnected from serving your Lord is foreign to the pages of the Bible. You are bound to serve your Lord, even if you make yourself your Lord. 
There is nothing that you do with your time, your resources, your energy that is not directed to the Lord or to mammon in some way. Everything that you do is out of fear, love, and trust to the one you call master. Everyone, for example, fears their master. Fear is when you are worried what will happen to you if you displease your master, if you live wrongly, and then your master has to come and correct it. You fear displeasing God and ruining your relationship, your relationship to him with sin. If Christ is your master, you will naturally fear that. It's a good thing. You don't want to mess it up. And of course, Jesus is gracious and merciful. He abounds in steadfast love, forgiveness. That's who he is as your master. But even then, we don't want to disobey him. We want to love him. We want to give life to him. But if mammon is your master, you will fear what will happen if this item in your life goes or you lose this or that. You're worried about every other little thing on this earth. You know those hoarder shows that they always show on TV about you going to someone's house and they've never gotten rid of anything in the 50 years they've had this house? That shows us a little bit of what mammon looks like when you fear losing it. A hoarder gives a witness of what mammon does to a person. Hoarders are afraid to let whatever item go for this reason or that reason, sentimental, nostalgia, you have it. The fear of getting rid of something or even letting something go in your life is what happens when you have mammon as a god. If you are willing to wager your eternal salvation because you can't let go of this or that toy or, or this or that job or this or that bad relationship or even when the time comes for your life to end, if you cannot let it go, even the letting go of your life for the sake of Christ, then mammon of earthly life is master. Fearing Jesus, however, means that I will not be afraid of man. I will not be afraid of anything, not even my health or my life going away. What can mortal man do to me after all the Psalms say? I am more worried about displeasing Jesus, disappointing him by my words, my thoughts, my actions, and that drives me. The fear of Jesus leads to a correct life. It leads to faith that abounds in love. And just like that, we also love our master. Everyone loves their master. Love is when you depend on your God. Love is when you rely on your Lord. You cling to your Lord. You will not be parted from him. Love shows itself in what you will do anything for your Lord, even if it means die for the Lord's bidding, as the martyrs of old did, who loved not their lives even unto death for their master. The love of God will manifest itself as you devote your life to Christ. The love of mammon, on the other hand, that's that goal that you chase, regardless of what happens to others. The love of mammon becomes addiction that you crave above all things, and something that you get sour over when you don't receive it. It leads to hatred, spite, and envy. We see what love for your master looks like in the Bible from all over the place. In fact, in the Gospels, we see this quite evidently. Remember the rich young man in the Gospels? He went away sad. He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus loves the man, and he looks at him and says, if you would be, you know, you know what it says in the law, and he's like, yeah, I've done all that stuff. And he says, one thing you lack, just sell everything and come be with me, follow me. And he went away sad, because we're told he had great possessions, great mammon. He loved his mammon, he couldn't part from it, and so he parted from Jesus instead. The man loved his money more than Christ. It was the mammon he served. But on the other hand, remember the tax collector Zacchaeus, that wee little man? who then Jesus came to his house and he stood up when people accused him and he said, I will pay back four times the amount of anyone that I have cheated, which is twice the amount that the law prescribed. This was an overflowing of a love for Jesus as his master. And we're told that Jesus was pleased at this show of love and said that salvation has indeed come to this house for this too. As the son of Abraham, God has come to seek and to save what is lost. And Zacchaeus has been found. Jesus says Zacchaeus acted this way because Jesus had given him that salvation that freed him from his love of mammon. 
And of course, finally, you also trust your master. You see, your master has you covered. Even if the worst happens to you, your master has your back. He can rescue you. He can pay off your debts. He can wipe the slate clean. He can save you from any trouble. And certainly, your master Jesus has proven that he can do this for you too. He can rescue you from death, even if it needs to be done. And indeed, it will be done one day. He will speak the word, the tombs be opened, and you will come out because he's your master and he has you covered. He has paid for all of your sins. The price was for his own life so that you can trust in him and take refuge in him. Put your trust in the Lord. Mammon, on the other hand, will tell you when you put all your effort into thinking this thing or that thing, you'll finally be happy, right? You'll finally have what you want. You can try to put your pledge, your security there, and it usually isn't in your own strength. It's in your own help. The God of mammon eventually just leaves you to your own devices, and those fail. Health comes to an end. Beauty fades away. Money dries up. At the end of the day, if I'm to trust in the God of mammon, I find that I'm severely lacking. Thinking that human might and military strength is something to trust in is folly. And it always leads to death in the scriptures. And so it is that Jesus teaches us today with loving one and and you can't have two masters. He teaches us here that we all fear, love, and trust our master goes one way or goes the other. The question now is this, whom do you serve? I implore you today, Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is your master. Jesus has made himself your Lord. By virtue of your baptism, you have died with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you now live with him. You are bound now to Christ. Nothing can undo what your Lord Jesus has done. If you are far from Jesus, he is gracious. He invites you back to himself. Jesus will receive you no matter what you have done, no matter how far you've gone away. You can trust him. He is your master. And since Jesus has made you his own, as St. Paul writes in Philippians, let us strive together to make Jesus our own. Let us devote ourselves to him, not to mammon. You see, the problem with mammon goes back to what was said at the beginning. Mammon is the desire for something that in the end is not ours, but only what we have through trust with God. Mammon is me treating that apartment at the seminary like it was mine, and I can do whatever I wanted with it. But still, at the end of the day, I had to move out of it. And if I marked up or did anything to cause damage, pay the fines. It was never mine to begin with. It belonged to someone else. And in the end, I turned over the keys to the landlord as I left. And the day will come when we each are called to account to our Lord. You and I will give the keys of our life back to him. He is the Lord, after all. And we will give an account of what we have done with the stewardship, with what we have been given, whether that be for good or for bad. So may the Lord indeed make us trustworthy then to bring those things which he has given to us. And for those who have devoted their life to Christ, their master, whether you are rich or poor, whether you are young or old, whether it was small or great, whatever devotion you have given to Christ will be rewarded. Did you catch what Jesus, our Lord, said about that? Jesus says this, If then you have not been faithful in that which is another's, the Lord's, who will give you that which is your own? See, on the day of judgment, on the day of the resurrection, Jesus will give us not a trust, not a contract, but what's yours. The meek shall inherit the earth. That's how Jesus puts it. You see, Jesus has won eternal life. And that life that he has given and has won and gives to you is not a loan that you will one day pay back like you will now. Rather, what Jesus will give to you is what is yours. Eternal life is not Jesus giving you a contract to sign and now you have to obey the terms and conditions of the contract. What Jesus has for you is the deed to the house that he turns over. 
But Jesus has won. What is Jesus's? He gives to us to share it. Jesus tells his followers that they will rule with him. The followers of Christ will have a share in his lordship. The Lord of the entire universe will allow us to also share in that with him. What you have here is indeed only a loan. To be given back to God, it is expected back. But what your master Jesus has won for you is so much better. It is life. It is your life. Jesus has won for you your life. It is truly your own. It's a gift given to him by him. Jesus, whom we call Lord, always and for all eternity, has won for us this eternal life. The day is going to come when Jesus gives to us what is ours. And dear brothers and sisters in Jesus, this is the day which the Lord has made. What Jesus has won, we have now by faith, but soon we shall have it by sight. And not just simply as an entrustment, but rather as a share in his lordship. What Jesus has in store for us is a share with his God and Father. We are participants, not servants. Friends, as Jesus puts it, because Jesus is God's Son, tied now to human flesh, to you and to me. You see, Jesus has gone on this to let you know exactly what he has paid for and who he has paid it for with. And now Jesus, he has what belongs to you. Not in order that I can be my own God and now I can just do whatever I please. Ha ha, finally. That's not the point. But rather now with the intention to cause life to thrive because God will give it to us, we who have been cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ. So indeed, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with thanksgiving and know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and it is he who has also saved us. We are his And Jesus has and gives what is yours. Serve Christ then with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all your money, with all your time, with all your might. In his name, amen. The grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God your Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us now with great joy go before our God to confess who he is and what he does for us as we tie our story into his, as we stand as we are able to confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. Now we bring to the Lord what is his we now collect our tithes and offerings as we serve him, even in this way, as we sing also our offertory.
not stand and bring our prayers and petitions and our needs as we fear, love, and trust our Master. We do that with prayer as well as we come, be come before him now. Almighty God, we give you thanks for all of your goodness, and we bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, and for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service, Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify our homes with your presence. Bless them with joy. Keep all of our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Now unite also the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, let your blessing remain upon the seed time and the harvest, the commerce, the industry, the leisure and rest, the art and culture of our people, and take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and be with all who put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just reward for their labor, and also the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, by your word and spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Lord, we especially bring before you Martha, who will soon be called into your presence. Continue to be with her family and remind of the hope of the resurrection and the life of the world to come. Also for Greg, Bud, Greg, Marvin, and Angie. Lord, we give thanks for Olivia, who gave uh, birth to her baby girl this past week. Lord, we ask you to keep both mother and child going forward and to bring Renly into the waters of baptism. Lord, we give, actually, we give also that thanks for Kevin, who has had a, a good surgery this last week and continues to recover, and for Paul and Jackie, who celebrate their wedding anniversary. Lord, for those women who also are still pregnant, we ask that you would be with Stacy, Samantha, Bonnie, Elizabeth, that you would be with all of our members here at Christ Lutheran, that you would bless them with faith and devotion to you. Be with all of our marriages here in this congregation, defend them from the evil one, and remind us that they give bear witness to your son Jesus and his bride, the church, us. Lord, be with all of our families, keep them safe this summer as we prepare now in the next month and a half to go back to school and to back to those vocations. Bless them as they prepare to enter into that. Be with teachers as they prepare for another year of education, that they would do their best to point the children in the way that they should go. Lord, that you would be with our schools, keep them safe, bless those who are in them, and to bring them through another year safely as well. Lord, for all those who put their hands to any useful task and vocation, for those who are firefighters, police officers, doctors and nurses, EMS, and those who respond in any emergency, that they would care for the needs of others, especially when we are at rest. Be with doctors and nurses in hospitals as they give good care to patients and strive to do their best to give good medicine. And Lord, be with the shut-ins of our congregation. You would grant them peace, the companionship that comes from you, and the joy that comes from being together with your people, the church. Lord, continue to be with Joan, Shirley, Dwayne, Mel and Luis, Lowell and Diane, Lyman and Sherry, for Donna, Clara, Judy, Raleigh and Janice, for Elaine, Joan, Opal, Mabel, Daryl, Velda, Janice, Roger, Verna, and Priscilla. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, all these things and whatever else that you know that we need, grant to us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. For our final hymn this evening, a reminder afterwards, you can go and enjoy some ice cream through the double doors there as we do that. But before we have that, we sing our final hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.